So it's a great pleasure to welcome Thomas Gertz. He's coming from the Copenhagen University and uh, we have a collaboration with him. So he's going to talk about evaluation of dynamic risk prediction models. Thank you very much for inviting me again to my favorite city in France. <laughs> and I'm, my, my talk is similar to the first talk today. However, I'm a mathematician. Even though uh, I would not present any formulas, it will still be different in the, in the style of presentation. That's, no, uh, that's, that's not surprising. Um, I'm not talking about the details, but still uh, remember the details. And if you have questions, you can either interrupt me or ask them uh, after, after the talk. So uh, I will introduce statistical risk prediction models, and I will illustrate the problem of uh, of when this becomes dynamic with a, with a data set and a research project that I have on leukemia research. And then I will um, demonstrate the dynamics uh, in risk prediction models and how to evaluate dynamic risk prediction models. That's the, the last part of the talk. So to begin with, and that's very similar to the points that the first speaker was making. So I'm saying here that we're interested in the absolute risk of a person is developing cancer in a given period of time. So there are two things that are important here. One is the prediction should be stated in terms of an absolute risk, and there should be a well-defined period of time in which, uh, which that um, is studied. And uh, more generally, we can say the absolute risk of an event is the probability that an individual with given risk factors and a given age will, will have the event within the defined period of time. Now, um, we call the absolute risk or the prediction um, calibrated, or even the model calibrated, if, um, if out of 100 people that all receive a pre predicted risk probability of x percent, roughly uh, x will have the event. So that's, that's the definition of calibration, um, the best that I could, um, could find. That's not a mathematical definition. I'm, I'm not really aware of uh, a very good mathematical definition. And the, the problem is that you need to condition on the exact value of x here. So if, if x is uh, 0.539, then this would be a condition on this, uh, and that's the problem with calibration. <coughs> However, we, I will use the term in the following next slide. And then I also <coughs> have to say that once more, conditional risk that such as hazards or hazard ratios do not directly correspond to prediction. Now, um, what, is, what is dynamic about um, risk? And uh, dynamic means uh, something is changing or is able to change and to adapt. And for the patient, that's clear. It's, the, it's unfortunately the disease that can, uh, that can change over time or does change over time. Sometimes it's fortunate if the treatment, which also may change over time, uh, works, then the disease is going away, may come back again, and, uh, and uh, Sometimes the disease is just getting worse, and uh, all this uh, depends, of course, on the environment, which is also time dependent, and, and things can change it <coughs> in the environment. For the model, or for the person who, who is aiming or trying to make a risk prediction model, it is mostly uh, you need to you need to focus on the time point where you make the prediction. So that's one uh, fixed uh, fixed thing that you have to uh, choose, and the other is the prediction horizon. So how long uh, in time do you want to make your predictions? And what, what else is changing? Of course, the event status is changing for the subjects. And then also measurements of biomarkers and um, treatment and other things, like questionnaire results, can be updated dynamically in time. <coughs> now. What's the purpose of, of, the, of the statistical model here? We, we, try to, um, we try to use information of patients that we have seen before, where we have seen both the risk factors and the outcome. And we try to summarize this information in order to give uh, the new person, the new patient, some advice on, on his case or her case. And, 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 this, and this, um, uh, this text here is copied and pasted from the National Cancer Institute, and that's about screening. And uh, a similar thing can be done if you, if you replace um, developing of cancer with, the, with, let's say, the probability of relapse for a cancer patient. 
And when we um, make this uh, this exchange uh, between the event uh, developing cancer and developing relapse, then we are into uh, personalized medicine. And indeed, statistical models can both give advice to a patient and to clinicians, but also they can be the basis of uh, a design of clinical trials where you investigate whether or not a new uh, personalized treatment is, is going to work. Now, um, how do we make these models? So, the, the, the definition of a statistical model here is it's a, it's a specification of the relation of the, of the risk markers and measurements that we have on, on the subject or patient and uh, at the absolute risk. So, in some, some, some way, these, uh, this relation has to be specified and, uh, and in order to do this in the best possible way, we usually start by screening the factors that are of potential interest for making predictions. And when I write the uh, write, um, screen here in, uh, in quotes, then I mean there are many different ways of doing this and there are no, no, not really um, accepted um, procedures that always work. So this is something that the the person who, uh, who is the subject matter, person who knows about the research field, needs to do in close collaboration with a statistician. So neither a backward elimination will do this correctly, nor just personalized uh, 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 decisions of the, of, the, of the research person alone will be su sufficient. <coughs> and uh, similar for the next step, when the model is fitted, to the training data, then again, there are a lot of strategies. How do you fit the model? So some say, okay, I will always use a residual plot. So, but, but what do you do after you have looked at the residual plot? Do you decide your model does not fit very well? Then you introduce a new uh, relation between the risk factors and the absolute risk, and so on. So there are a lot of things going on that we often are not able to write down in terms of an algorithm, but we should. Because when we aim, when we aim to say something about this is a good model, then we should take into account all the uncertainties in the process of making the model as well. <clears throat> now, finally, the, mo the model is validated in in terms of either internal uh, validation, where we just use the same data set, or we use it uh, in, in, uh, with a cross-validation scheme. And, uh, or externally when we have some independent data set and we evaluate whether or not the model is, is predicting very well. Again, here there are not, no commonly accepted standards. So if you apply temporal plot validation once, then I'm quite sure in most cases the result will depend on the random seed on your computer that you were choosing. So some people then repeat temporal plot validation 10 times. And, uh, and, and, and so on. So the, there are no commonly accepted standards of how to do that, and, and that has to be done in, in collaboration between the statistician and the subject matter person. <coughs> now for, for illustrating the dynamical part of the risk prediction modeling, I have this uh, research project, uh, I choose this research project here, not because of the <coughs> Very, uh, it is producing a, a nice prediction model. The problem is there are not enough patients to, to be able to pro pro propose a nice prediction model here, but it is very useful to illustrate the dynamics of, uh, of risk prediction modeling. So here the, the aim was, uh, so the background was that eosinophilia, that's a condition in which um, the eosinophilia count um, exceeds a certain threshold. and. Um, and, and that has been, uh, has been studied and it was shown that it has a prognostic impact if you, uh, if you look at the value or the condition yes, no, at the time where these leukemia patients receive the transplant. So, um, so at that time point, uh, yeah, there's evidence from other studies that, that, that this um, measurement has some prognostic value. And the aim of our research project was now to move from the date of the transplant of these leukemia patients to the date where these leukemia patients have a different condition called chronic graft host disease. That's when the body does not accept the, the transplant and you can, can uh, enter this, uh, this, uh, this state, chronic graft host disease. And that is, of course, a different day where this was diagnosed for the patient. However, we will analyze all the patients um, follow up from the day where this, uh, where this uh, condition um, materialized. 
And it is clear that when we move from the day of the transplant to the day of the chronic graft host disease, then the patients that never in the follow-up period that we are studying develop graft host disease, they do not enter into our study. So already here it becomes clear that the dynamic thing when we move from the time origin to the uh, landmark time point, we will look at a different data set, a different subset of the patients. <coughs> Um, yes, so, so we analyzed event times after, after the onset of chronic graft resource disease. And now to, uh, to have a look at the outcome, that's a multi-state model. And we see here, uh, we, we, every person starts with receiving the transplant and then several things can happen. You can enter the acute graft resource disease state and after that you can even move on to the chronic graft resource disease state and you can first have a relapse of the two of the of the leukemia and then uh, move to chronic graft resource disease and the other way around. <coughs> and finally we distinguish um, relapse related death from treatment related death and uh, and that's the that's the outcome in, in our study. So highly complex uh, situation. <coughs> and uh, what is kind of standard in these uh, in these analysis of leukemia data is that relapse and graft resource disease conditions are treated as time-dependent covariates. So, so that's, um, that's what, what, what's kind of standard in that field of research. You cannot be cured in this model. Of course, you can, you can of course stay in this uh, state for the, for the follow-up period. You can also stay in this uh, state, but the thing is, once you enter this state, there will be new treatment uh, I'm not sure if, 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 if they can define when a patient is cured. So if the doctor is able to look at the patient and say, you are cured, then, uh, then uh, we could have a cure state in here. If that's not possible, then I don't know, then uh, we don't. Good, so, so we, have a, we have a couple of baseline characteristics. By baseline, I mean here the date of the transplant. So these, these informations are from the transplant date. And, um, and um, since we do not have a lot of patients, only 142 if we, if we have them all, but then some of them have missing values in some of the, in some of the predictors and so on. That's why we constructed some kind of disease score from all these variables. And that will be used to adjust uh, our regression analysis in, in later pictures. So, so these are the these are the time independent uh, characteristics of the patient, and there are some more that I do not have uh, space to list here. But more interesting are the time dependent covariates. And here we have uh, here we have the start of the data set where we have here the patient number UTN, and then we have the date where the measurement was taken, and we see the EO eosinophil count is given here. And then there are some other measures. IgG is another inflammation uh, marker in the blood, and and some and, and two other blood blood test markers that are also continuously in time almost uh, measured for, for all of these patients. So there's a lot of information in uh, in this project. <coughs> Finally, what else is uh, time dependent? The, the conditioning re re regimes and the steroid treatment is changing all the time. You will see that in a little bit. And, uh, and of course, as I said that before, the disease status can change. So when a person has a relapse, then the disease status has changed. <coughs> now we look here at, uh, at one sample patient, and this is an illustration of, of the full data that we have for this patient. Uh, and we start here by the day, the green vertical bar illustrates the day where the transplant was, uh, was done. And you see the black dots, you can follow them here over time. This is the this is the um, eosinophil count, and uh, and when the count exceeds the magic threshold 0.5, uh, then the condition eosinophilia is is satisfied. And we see also that this uh, light green area here is a is a period of non-steroid immunosuppressive treatment, whereas the the um, the light red area is a, is a period of steroid treatment. And that was initiated by the onset of the graft versus host disease uh, in this patient. So here you see a patient, and we can follow him or her either from the day of the transplant or from the landmark time point 
which is given by the red vortex of R. <coughs> mm. You can also see, since there's no charcoal line, that this patient did not have acute rock versus host disease. <coughs> but finally here, the black line indicates that the, that the follow-up stopped with the, with the event relapse. Now we move to the next person, and this is more of <coughs> what to illustrate uh, what happens when we do not know the value of the, uh, of the longitudinal marker for all dates, then we imputed imputed the value. We just did that by a linear, by a linear uh, connection between the previous and the next uh, measurement of this marker. And when there was too much space between in time, too much space in, in time between the, the previous and the next marker, then we just did not use this patient for the analysis. So this was just to illustrate that there are missing values and we of course have to deal with it. It was a quite pragmatic approach. Now, now this is a more uh, complicated case and you see here, this person is actually positive. So this person has the condition, and the reason is at the day of the chronic rock versus host disease onset, the count was above the 0.5 uh, threshold. So here the condition is satisfied, and you see also that this, this patient receives a, a, a treatment in, in a different way than the previous two, and there's overlap. So when the green light, green, the light red area overlap, then we get a, an ugly color here. And that indicates that both treatments are given at the same time. And, and the, the, a big problem of this study is that the count, the longitudinal marker, reacts to the treatment. So there's feedback. So maybe the high count indicates a new treatment, and then due to this treatment, the count goes down. So there's feedback in the data, and, and that is extremely difficult to deal with in a statistical model, particularly in the, in the risk prediction model. But I have a final, uh, a final patient here, and that's more, mostly to show that, sh so this person is maybe something we would call cured, because this person survived for a quite long period, after five years, and there's no treatment in the end of, the, of, this, of his follow-up or her follow-up, and so it's possible to survive all this, um, this procedure. <coughs> okay, so more uh, back to the concepts so the the, the dynamics in risk prediction models starts by saying, here's my time origin. So time origin <coughs> is the start of follow-up. In this case, it was uh, the day of the transplant. But we can move to the landmark time, which could be the onset of chronic graft host disease. And that, by definition, the landmark time is another day where the clinician or patient are interested in the prediction of the, of the future. And that is in order to uh, address uh, uh, certain personal things, but also in order to decide for, for the next treatment. And, uh, and we can, we, there are more examples than just the day of diagnosis, the day of treatment. You can also say the date where a new screening result or new blood test was performed is a candidate landmark time point where we want to update our prediction. <coughs> and then, yeah, that's for the mathematicians. We can, of course, do this continuously in time. We can say, uh, in, uh, for each value of xx, I can update my prediction model. But that's more for the mathematicians. I think we should keep in mind that this is something that should be used in practice for patients, and then it does only make sense if it makes sense for the patient and the clinician. <laughs> so the prediction horizon is the length of the period after the time origin in which we follow the patient for the event. So we can say it's of interest to study the event risk within one year time horizon. I can also study the event risk within a five year time horizon. So that's, uh, that's two uh, time scales. Um, and the picture is like this. We start here at the time origin and we can move to the landmark and then we wait for the events in the predefined <coughs> period with the time horizon. So if I put my time horizon shorter, then I would not catch this event. That's how it is. And um, what, what do we recognize? We recognize that at the landmark time point, what the sample size does change. Of course, we cannot include death. We dead people sometimes, like in my leukemia example. Uh, there are other reasons why the sample size um, <coughs> changes, and that was because we only included patients who developed the condition chronic graft versus host disease, and so the others were excluded. And um, and we can we can uh, we can have a, we will always have a, a, a change in the length of the remaining follow-up because when we have a when we have a five-year study 
and we move from the time we're reaching to the first year, then of course the average uh, follow-up time will only be four years, and that has to be taken into account. And the longitudinal market history is usually increased, so that's a good thing, so we get more information uh, when we move to the landmark time point about the longitudinal market. <laughs> And, uh, and and on the on the other side, uh, other side, the age of non-updating measurements. So things that do update in reality, but we have no measurements of the update, and th that's a problem because when we move from the time of reaching to the landmark, then they they get older and maybe less informative for for making predictions. <clears throat> now, what changes for the modeler? For the modeler at the landmark time point. And we can decide to have a new selection of important variables, so we can repeat the screening for variables, and that uh, that can be uh, very useful and very uh, very important to do. And we can also uh, say if we look at modeling assumptions again at the landmark time point, like proportional hazards assumption or functional form, which relates the covariance risk factors to the to the absolute risk of the event. And we can re-estimate our regression parameters. We don't have to, but we'll show that uh, later on. And we can recalibrate the model. And that, that could be very important because it could well be that the patients who survive until the landmark S have a different baseline risk of development event as compared to the population which is alive at the time of which. <coughs> now, now, a very general picture is this one here. So we have on the we have the marker process, which allows us the dynamic updating of our of our model. So this would be the eosino field count, and and it's of course observed in discrete time. Not always you uh, you will have so many observations as we just saw. Often, like when you have a questionnaire data, then you will have one, two, three, or four values for each person. So that that's uh, it's important to recognize that's in discrete time, and it may be that baseline risk factors affect the marker process. So there can be a correlation between baseline risk factors and the marker process, so we can model the, uh, the, uh, the effect of these, uh, these uh, or the, the, the joint distribution of these uh, two bad variables. And then there's, there, there's treatment, and treatment can also change in time, and, and that's, uh, that can be a problem, in particular if there's uh, feedback. So if the Market, high marker process values indicate treatment and then treatment uh, um, reduces the marker or has an effect on the marker values. And finally, all these things together have an effect on the event time outcome. So that's, the, that's, a challenging, uh, that's a challenging world and the most uncomfortable thing is, is this. Uh, here we have all these unobserved confounders and we know that our models do not predict very well. However, if we had all the information available, then maybe we could. So we have a lot of hope in, in that we can develop or improve our models, and, and that's, that's all about unobserved confounders. Unfortunately, unobserved confounders can also be time time dependent. That's clear. <clears throat> now, now what, what do we have uh, uh, in our toolbox we can, uh, in order to make absolute risk prediction models? The first and mo most um, <coughs> most uh, straightforward thing is to do survival regression analysis at the landmark. So we, we take the data set which is available at the landmark and we apply, let's say, Cox regression or fine grain regression if we have competing risks. And then we translate uh, regression coefficients into, into a, a predicted absolute risk of the event. And if we have a longitudinal marker, we can include of course, all the history of the longitudinal marker up to the landmark time point. And I call this two-stage two models. I can then say, okay, I have uh, 112 uh, values for this patient. This is a bit much. I can't include 112 variables, and I didn't uh, know how to include them. So I can first summarize the history of the longitudinal marker process for each patient, giving me a summary measure or this patient, let's say the, the running mean or running median um, or something like the variability of the marker values in the history up to the landmark and use that as a new uh, predictor for my, for my landmark cost of fine grade regression model. Now, there's also this uh, group, uh, a class of joint models and Bordeaux is, uh, is famous for developing joint models and here you, uh, here you specify a model, a statistical model for the joint distribution of the of the longitudinal marker and the event time outcome and the baseline risk factors. And, and that can be uh, very useful because then you can improve
improve the summary that you get in this two-stage two approach by using the data from the other patients in order to, uh, in order to um, be more precise with, with the prediction. There is, there is a K part, uh, 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 there's, a, there's, a, there's a problem here with the person parameters. Most of these, or many of these drug models, include something like a random effect or frailty. And that, that, that's, that's a problem for prediction because when my new patient is coming, I don't know the value of this frailty or random effect. So I have to do uh, some kind of averaging or integrating out over the random effects and frailties in order to receive, to receive a prediction. But I'm, I'm sure in, in a few years, this will be, uh, will be very uh, quickly and easy, easily done. So, so currently, there are some, some problems with the computers that are too slow in order to make this very efficient. But I think that will change very soon. And uh, the last class I wanted to discuss here is the class of multi-state models. So when I have regression models for all the transitions between the time-dependent events, and now I should just switch back to the in this picture, so if I have a regression model for each arrow in this figure, then I can try to uh, combine the, the regression models for all the arrows of, in, in this uh, complex fit figure in order to make an, a prediction of the absolute event, let's say, of treatment-related death. And that's, that's what, what we call multi-state model here. And, uh, and when I have uh, fitted all these regression models that requires uh, some, some amount of data, obviously. But if I have done that, then I can then uh, use what happened to the training patients, the patients in the training data, in order to uh, in order to assess the likelihood of the most possible of, of the most likely uh, pathway of the new patient, and by by doing that, and um, improve the predictions for the new patients. <coughs> now, um, now, uh, how do we extract predictions from, from all these? Um, Regression models. So the the most uh, uh, the most uh, often seen one is the explicit formula approach, which requires that we translate the predictions of hazard models or joint models into a, a formula for the prediction of the absolute risk. And then you all you need to do is you need to implement that formula. If you have a complex multi-state model, that can be quite difficult first to write down this complex formula and then also to implement it in an efficient way in the computer. And uh, if, you, if you have no time to wait for people implementing that in a general way, there's this uh, discrete event simulation approach where you, uh, where you use the computer to simulate hypothetical uh, patients and uh, based on the regression models that you have fitted for all the transition intensities and uh, in order to in order to simulate the likelihood of the possible paths in the multi-state model. And, and when you do that, let's say 10,000 hypothetical patients, then the average times they hit the uh, terminal event state will then be the prediction of the absolute, uh, absolute risk for this event. <coughs> now, when we update predictions at the landmark, then we can update the modeling. I've uh, noted that before, so we can repeat screening of factors, we can repeat tuning of our model, and we can estimate the regression parameters again. But it's not necessarily clear that this is an advantage, and an alternative is, is we use, let's say, a joint model for the full period of time in which we have studied uh, the, the, the patients, and then we can maybe use a formula like that in order to make a prediction for the, for the event between time s and time t. <coughs> And uh, in, in order to evaluate how, how well these uh, prediction models are doing, we can look at prediction error, we can look at discrimination ability and calibration ability. <coughs> and um, here's the, now there's, actually there is a formula in my talk. So we see here the, the outcome variable is now defined as a function of two time points, S and T. So S is the landmark time point, and T is the time horizon. So I'm saying, zero if the patient has no event in that time period, and one if the patient has, has an event in that time period. And uh, I denote by r hat i, hat indicating that I have used some training set in order to estimate the, the risk, um, the risk of the event predicted by some model. And, and the mean squared error, prediction error, or also called Dreyer score, is then this simple formula here, and just averaging over the squared residuals between the zero one outcome and the predicted risk, and um, and, and and 
here it's clear we need either we need some test set, independent test set, or we have to do uh, a cross validation approach. <coughs> and we, I note here that the bias score measures both discrimination and calibration. So if you have a miscalibrated model, then the bias score will show that. And if you have a model not well discriminating, then also then also the the model bias score will show that. But we are sometimes interested in discrimination alone, and if we are that, then we, we move from the bias score to the area and the curve, or to the C index, where it's very similar to the area and the curve, and the only problem here is maybe the interpretation. So because in area and the curve, we condition on the future. We say, uh, we say suppose we have uh, chosen a person I who does not have the event, and we choose a person J at random who did, did have the event, what's then the probability that person I had the lower risk than person J? So we condition on the outcome, which is in the future, in order to assess the law. This is, this is how most people are doing. <coughs> and there are some technical complications, and uh, you're welcome to ask me about all the details, but there's no uh, space today to, to discuss them. So we, when we have sensor data, and that, that uh, occurs when we are not following the patients until the very end. So if we do not follow every person until the person has died, then we have lost to follow up somewhere. And if we if we uh, and if we we have that, then we need to deal with this in some way. And one way of dealing with this is inverse probability of sensory weighting, and another one is uh, is pseudo values. And both guarantee that the that the performance uh, measures are asymptotically, that means that we have a very large data set unaffected by the sensory. And we know here that competing risk like death is, is not lost to follow up because once you're dead, you, you cannot have the event of interest any longer. So when you have a competing risk, then you need a prediction of this competing risk as well. And the, and the clinician and the patient will only be able to make an interpretation to the predicted risk of the event of interest when they at the same time know the predicted risk for the competing competing events. So then everything becomes two-dimensional at least. If we have uh, only one data set, then we can use uh, cross-validation or, or some bootstrap approach in order to, um, to avoid over over optimistic um, prediction performance results. So the, these things have to be combined. So we have competing risks, we have loss to follow up sensor data, and we have to apply a, a, a data splitting. So that's a quite complex procedure when we try to estimate how well the model will do on new patients. <coughs> and and I'm, I have um, illustrated this with a prior score here from my leukemia data set, and you can see. These curves are not very smooth, and the reason is that there are few patients in this data set. And I have, uh, I have problems um, fitting, fit, fitting models uh, with many variables, so, so, then, so there's not, not really much I can do. So here I have uh, fitted two different uh, two-stage models where, where both are adjusted for the risk disease score, which we define based on the other risk factors in, in two or three categories. And, uh, and, and then here I compare the red line where I use the maximum eosinophil count in the history, in the 200 day history of each patient before the chronic uh, graft versus host disease onset. And I have another variable in my model which is the variability of this uh, um, eosinophil count. And I compare that to, to adding the value at the transplant day and adding the value at the chronic proper host disease day. So two different summaries of the patient history of this, uh, of this uh, longitudinal marker. And we see there seems to be a slight advantage of, of using the value at the transplant day and the value at the onset day of chronic graft versus host disease. And that's true for both events. So on the left-hand side, I have a prediction of treatment-related mortality. And on the right-hand side, I have relapse related mortality. But you can see the null model, which ignores, ignores all the covariates, and is, is doing as good almost. So there's really not, not enough information in this data set. And, and this is actually, uh, uh, leukemia patients are a case where gender and age do not play a role. So, so in this case, we really do not have nice uh, predictive models. Not yet. <coughs> And 
and, uh, and just so, so okay so so here I start at the landmark time and I follow and I, I move the, the time horizon so here the, the interpretation here at 600 days is this is the predictive performance of the models for predicting the event which is treatment related mortality in the time frame between zero and 600 days okay? and then the next picture um, is, is different here I fix the time horizon to be 12 months. So here we have a 12 month time horizon fixed and we move the landmark. So here we have landmark results for 0, 3, 6 and 12 based on a different data set. And here we compare models like the multi-state model approach and the Cox regression and find a grade for, for, for landmarking. And we see no difference. And actually, these curves here is again the uh, it's a cross validated bias score. We see no difference, and we also see no difference in the model with no covariance. So again, the leukemia data set where we have not no information or almost no information at all. If we look at the prediction for death, then at least these models seem to be a little bit better than the model which ignores the covariance. But it's not really um, motivating a lot of follow-up um, discussions. And, and then my colleague here, who's the first author, Juliana, she got a bit frustrated about these results, and then she, she moved the, the, the picture, and now she shows the reduction in prediction error instead of uh, the prediction error itself. And then we can see some, uh, some, some differences, but look at the, the y-axis, so this is a really a small, uh, a small improvement that we see here. So we, we will not expect a lot from these models, but again here, uh, we can see now we can suddenly see differences between no covariates and using the covariates and the uh, uh, landmark model and the multi-state models using either uh, finite gray or cox. <coughs> okay, so um, I made it to the last two slides. So these are concluding comments about the uh, dynamic risk prediction modeling. So the first uh, comment here is that uh, if you have a dynamic risk prediction model, then you have two um, time scales, and one is the landmark time point, and the other is the time horizon. So you can move them at the same time, and you can fix one and move the other. Um, otherwise, nothing really changes. So when you have learned about how to evaluate a risk prediction model in survival analysis with sensor data, then you can apply all these techniques that you have learned to the dynamic setting. You have to be careful because you need to uh, pay attention to that you are not using information after the landmark for making predictions uh, in the future, that's clear. But otherwise, technically, from a statistical viewpoint, not a lot of things do change. <coughs> we have to be aware of that if, if our longitudinal measurement is affected by treatment, then we probably need a very complex statistical model in order to catch the, the joint distribution of, uh, of the treatment and the, and the longitudinal measurement. And that is in particular difficult in non-randomized studies. So if you have a non-randomized study, it's probably uh, not so clear how to interpret the prediction model uh, that you uh, develop. <coughs> anyway, we can, as usual, because it's the same technique, we use inverse probability weighting or something like that, and we use cross-validation, as usual, in order to compare different models, modeling strategies. And um, what, do we, what, do, what do we get? We usually have the question, what's the best model? That's what our collaborators are asking. Give me the best model. And then we have some sub-questions here. Is it worse to update the risk factors at the landmark? So suppose it's expensive to, uh, to measure this blood test. Then, uh, then we can ask the question, does the prediction improve when I use the value at the landmark as, as compared to, let's, let's say, the two-year-old value that I have from the, from the time origin. We can also ask the question whether or not it's worse to re-estimate the model and to do the screening <coughs> and the model that again at each landmark time point. So that, that can be tested and uh, we, can, uh, we can figure it out. And finally, we can we wonder at what, uh, at, on how much can a joint model improve um, or outperform a two-stage uh, landmark regression model? And that's a, that's, a, that's a question that I'm sure will be answered in both. Thank you for your attention. <coughs>